Blessed Resurrection Sunday! Next to the birth of Jesus, Resurrection Day is the most important time in the life of the followers of Jesus. We celebrate a risen Lord and Savior. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have sent your Son into the world to suffer, die, and rise again. We rejoice today in so great a salvation and in the transforming power of Jesus' resurrection in our lives so that we can walk in the power of the resurrection and in the newness of life. Today as your people we pray for you to do a transforming work in each of our lives so that our lives, our work, our moments and our days may be alive with the risen Christ. Lord we thank you for the birthday celebrant this week, Mani Norma Thank you, Lord, for her life and the faithfulness to you. Thank you, Lord God, for giving her 91 years of blessings. Lord, you know her struggles as well as her strengths. Help her both physically and especially spiritually for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There are two types of sports players. One who likes to win more than to get better. And the other one is one who likes to get better more than to win. Which player are you? 
In pickleball this just this past week, a person came up to me and said, you know Sam, you're, you're a good player. I want to play against you. I want to play against better players than myself. He was more concerned about getting better. He wants that challenge so he can be a better player. That same day, another player said to me, Bye Sam, thank you for leaving. <laughs> implying that she doesn't like playing against me because chances are good she'll lose. She was more concerned about winning than getting better. Yes, I like to win, but I'm accepting the fact that challenges are important in improving your game, even if it may feel uncomfortable to potentially lose. Today, I, I want you to feel uncomfortable. I want to give you potentially challenging issues that hits the core of your faith. I'm going to share with you things that may not be pleasant to hear. But as you listen, think about how you may respond in a respectful and reasonable way. I'm going to do this hopefully to make your faith stronger. A person named Charles Allen po uh, posted a and an answer on Reddit, which is an online discussion website. The post question was, is Christianity a scam? Is Christianity a scam? Charles Allen wrote, most certainly a big yes. Christianity is the most divided and destructive self-centered religion in the world today. Christianity loves to preach and hates to practice what they preach. The thousands of different man-made denominations have different beliefs and teachings, which proves division, envy, strife, and confusion, mostly for financial gain and status. Ian responded when, with this question that was posted on Reddit again, is Christianity the biggest scam ever? And this is what Ian wrote. My view is that religion generally is the biggest scam ever. But since Christianity is the single biggest religion, the answer is yes. It relies on the indoctrination of ancient beliefs and Bronze Age mythology, mainly into children far too young to differentiate between the fact and fiction, then reinforced throughout, the life, throughout life by the use of repetition and the ritualization of religious ceremonies both of which are recognized techniques for brainwashing. He continues, But of course, this only happens to believers. And to ensure that followers don't waver or leave, there's a threat that if they don't believe, quote, quote, in this invisible man in the sky, after they die, they'll be consigned to a place called hell where they'll exist for eternity in pain and torment. Psychologically, the former is a very powerful and alluring concept for vast numbers of people, whilst the latter is the ultimate scare tactic, both playing on some of the deepest human emotions, feelings, and innate superstitions, especially when, they, when that indoctrination and repetition throughout life are considered. The bottom line is that none of it is true. None of it even has a, the remotest bit of evidence to support it. Yet religions, Christianity in particular, go to great lengths by the way of the use of ancient texts and human psychology to convince people that it is true. What other word and, than scam could describe that? The Apostle Paul in Scripture deals directly head on with the faith of Christians if the core of their belief is a scam. Listen to his words in 1 Corinthians 15, 13 to 19. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, 
then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. Then all those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. Is Christianity a scam? How would you react or respond to that question? You know, some believers might respond, well, you know what, I believe what I believe and the case is closed. If a person has that kind of faith where there's no room for discussion or challenges, it's a blind faith, a faith that has no basis of reason. It's like a quote by Greg Koch, author Greg Koch, and it's, he writes, Faith, uh, faith, feet firmly planted in midair. Feet firmly planted in midair. Basically, no good foundation. Our beliefs, our beliefs must be based on reason to truly be strong. But Sam, when we put our faith in God, many times we blindly trust Him, right? His ways are higher than our ways, right? That's all true. Many times we put our faith in God without fully understanding His ways and purposes. But I wouldn't call it blind faith. Blind faith would imply that we have no reason to trust God. Blind faith is like a stranger off the streets tells me, hey, 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 um, give me $10,000 and I'll double it in a week. And I just blindly give him $10,000. That's blind faith. There is no good reason for me to trust that guy on the street. But with God, based on my understanding and based on, my, on the past experiences, there's definitely a good reason to put my trust in God. Yes, we may not completely understand the workings of God, but we can still have a faith based on reason and understanding. For example, do we completely understand the mechanical operation of a car? I know that some of our members are mechanically uh, wise in, in, in fixing cars. But most of us don't. We, but we still have faith in our car. It is reasonable to know that we can use it to get us back and forth from work. It takes faith, faith for us to get into the car and use it to drive to work. It's not a blind faith. It's a reasonable faith. And the more understanding of how extremely reasonable our faith is, the more willing for us to trust God even more. Today, my goal is to help you understand that there are many good reasons to put your faith in God. More specifically, the Christian faith based on the reality of the resurrection of Jesus. Just like Paul stated, if the resurrection of Jesus isn't true, isn't true, in essence, Christianity is all a big scam. We are all, we as believers of all people are the most pitiable in the world. And the core of Christ, the Christian faith is the resurrection of Jesus. Because if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, this would have meant he did not conquer death. This would have meant he was not God. This would have meant that we will all still be in our sins. All the sacrifices, all the hard work that we have done for God would all be in vain if the resurrection of Jesus was a scam, the biggest hoax in history. Today, I would like to present you some evidence to support that the resurrection of Jesus was not a scam. It was real and you can bet your soul on it. Number one, the resurrection of Jesus is worthy of scrutiny. The resurrection of Jesus is worthy of scrutiny. Most scams are not willing to be scrutinized for the sake of hiding the truth. They would, even, they would not, not even encourage, not even encourage the thought 
of what they're saying is false. They would be saying, no, 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 don't even dare think what I'm saying is false. Yet Paul says this so openly and passionately when he says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. Non-believers might say to might say to us, you know, you're weak-minded to believe such fairy tales. It's all myths and folklore. Let me let me share with you some quote quote weak-minded people who try to debunk the resurrection and what they have what and what they have to say about it. Lee Strobel, Lee Strobel, received a journalism degree from. University of Missouri and a Master's of Studies in Law degree from Yale Law School. And he says this, I didn't become a Christian because God promised I would have an even happier life than I had as an atheist. He never promised any such thing. Indeed, following Him would inevitably bring divine demotions in the eyes of the world. Rather, I became a Christian because the evidence was so compelling that Jesus really is the one and only Son of God who proved His divinity by rising from the dead. That meant following Him was the most rational and logical step I could possibly take. Sir Lionel Lukhu of the Guinness Book World of Records fame for his unprecedented 245 consecutive defense murder trial acquittals. That's right. Unprecedented 245 consecutive defense, defense murder trials acquittals. It, and he, he epitomized Christian enthusiasm and confidence in the strength of the case for the resurrection of Jesus when he wrote, I have spent more than 42 years as a defense trial lawyer appearing in many parts of the world and I'm still in active practice. I have been fortunate to secure a number of successes in my jury trials and I say unequivocally the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so overwhelming that it compels acceptance by proof which leaves absolutely no room for doubt. C.S. Lewis was a British writer, a literary scholar, an Anglican lay theologian, and past atheist, one who is against God. He held academic positions in, Eng in English literature in both Oxford University and Cambridge University. And he wrote, The resurrection of Jesus was the first event of its kind in the whole history of the universe. Jesus forced open a door that had been locked since the death of the first man. This is the beginning of a new creation. A new chapter in the cosmic history has opened, making a difference now and guaranteeing the eventual hope of bodily resurrection of all who follow Jesus. Number one, again, the resurrection of Jesus is worthy of scrutiny. Number two, my, my second point, number two, the resurrection of Jesus has proof beyond the Bible. The resurrection of Jesus has proof beyond the Bible. In the book entitled Cold Cut, I'm sorry, Cold Case Christianity, Cold Case Christianity by Jay Warner and Jimmy Wallace, the book shares some first century historians, unbiased first century historians that makes record of Jesus and his resurrection. They have no bias whatsoever, but are just stating history. Uh, Phlygion lived 80 to 140 AD. Phlygion wrote a, a chronicle of history around 104 AD. In this history, Phlygion also mentions the darkness around the crucifixion in an effort to explain it. Phlegion records that in the time of Tiberius Caesar, at full moon, 
there was a full eclipse of the sun from the 6th to the 9th hour, which would be from noon to 3 p.m. Also, he mentions Jesus, while alive, was of no assistance to himself, but that he arose after death and exhibited the marks of his punishment and showed how his hands had been pierced by nails. Again, this was from a non-religious historian, unbiased whatsoever. Lucian of Samosota, Samo, Samosota lived from 115 to 200 AD. Lucian was a great political writer who spoke sarcastically of, of Christ and Christians. But in the process, he did affirm that they were real people and never referred to them as fictional characters. He said this with a tone of sarcasm. The Christians, you know, worship a man to this day, the distinguished personage who introduced their novel rites and was crucified on that account. You see, these misguided creatures start with the general conviction that they are immortal for all time, which explains the contempt of death and voluntary self-devotion which are so common among them. And then it was impressed on them by their original lawgiver that they were all brothers from the moment they are converted and denied the gods of Greece and worship the crucified religious leader and live by his laws. All this they take quite on faith with the result that they were they, they, that they all despise all worldly good alike, goods alike regarding them merely as common property. From this account we could we could add to our description of Jesus. He taught about repentance and about the family of God. These, these teachings were quickly adopted by Jesus' followers and exhibited to the world around them. Jesus was true, was a true historical figure who changed lives. Josephus, who lived 37 to 101 AD, in more detail than any other non-biblical historian, writes about Jesus in his The Antiquities of the Jews in 93 AD. Josephus was born just four years after the crucifixion. He was a consultant for the Jewish rabbis at an early age, became, the, became a Galilean military commander by the age of 16, and he was an eyewitness to much of what he recorded in the first century AD. Under the rule of Roman Emperor, Emperor Vespasian, Josephus was allowed to write a history of the Jews. And this is what he writes. About this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man. For he was one who performed surprising deeds and was a teacher of such people to, as to accept the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. He was the Messiah. And when upon accusation of the principal men among us, Pilate had him c condemned to a cross. Those who had first come to love him did not cease. He appeared to them spending on the third day after Jesus was restored to life. For the prophets of God had foretold these things. And the tribe of the Christians has still to this day not disappeared. The resurrection of Jesus has proof even beyond the Bible. Number three. The resurrection of Jesus has proof in the lives of the believers. The resurrection of Jesus has proof in the lives of the believers. The most foolish thing a person can do is to suffer and die for a lie. So many people have suffered and died knowing Jesus really, resurrect, really resurrected from the dead. For example, the disciples. They would not go through all this pain and suffering for a lie. They walked with Jesus. They ate with Jesus. They grieved when He died. They even actually hid themselves. They were scared when Jesus died. John 20, 19 says, On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors 
being locked where the disciples were for the fear of the Jews. But what happened to these first century believers after they had multiple encounters with Jesus after His resurrection? They were no longer afraid, but became so bold in their faith that these are the things I'm going to share with you that they were willing to allow themselves to go through. Andrew, the brother of Peter, martyred by crucifixion bound, not nailed, but hung alive for two days, encouraging spectators to accept Jesus all the while. Bartholomew, martyred by being skinned alive and crucified, head downward by idol worshippers of Armenia. James the Greater, aka son of Zebedee, brother of John, he was beheaded or stabbed with a sword by Herod Agrippa around 44 AD. James the son of Alphaeus was martyred in, the, in his early 90s by being thrown from the pinnacle of the t Temple of Jerusalem, then stoned and head bashed with a club. Jude, or Thaddeus, who wrote the book of Jude, martyred by being beaten with a club, then crucified at 72 AD. Matthew, martyred about 60 AD by being st staked and speared to the ground. Simon Peter, martyred by crucifixion at Rome by Nero, crucified around 68 AD, upside down at his, at his request because he did not consider himself worthy to be crucified like Jesus. Mark, aka John Mark, martyred, dragged to death. Luke, the physician who wrote Luke and Acts, was hanged on an olive tree. Matthias, the disciple, who filled the place of for uh, Judas, was stoned and beheaded in Jerusalem. Now, do you think these disciples would have died in these various ways for a lie? I think not. They knew from personal experience, first-hand knowledge, that Jesus was wretched from the dead to the point that they're willing to die for this truth of, uh, of time in, in, in history. Jesus truly resurrected. Millions of people have suffered and died because of the power and the reality of, of the resurrection of Jesus. So many lives have been changed. Murderers, rapists, thieves. For someone to say so flippantly, that all this is a big fairy tale, this all this is just purely myth, mythology, has never done true diligence in researching the evidence. The resurrection of Jesus has proof in the lives of the believers. How has the resurrection of Jesus affected your life or the lives of people that you know personally? I've known so many believers that were willing to suffer for Jesus knowing and acknowledging that their hope in this life is not based upon this temporary world, but eternity with the risen Savior. Number one, the resurrection of Jesus is truly is worthy of scrutiny. Number two, the resurrection of Jesus has proof beyond the Bible. Number three, the resurrection of Jesus has proof in the lives of the believers. Take these evidences of the crucifixion and resurrection be like a booster shot to strengthen our faith. You know, after Paul states the reality of the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, he ends with this. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Brothers and sisters, because of the evidence, because of your understanding, because of the resurrection of Jesus is true, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, 
because you know that your labor is not in vain. We can continue in confidence, a life of obedience, a life that is used by God to serve others in small ways, medium ways, or large ways. Brothers and sisters, because of the reality of the, of the resurrection of Jesus, we can stand firm. Our faith is not a blind faith. It's a faith based on physical reality and facts. Because of the reality of the resurrection, we can stand firm like the martyred disciples. In times of trials, troubles, and persecutions, doing right and being a light for Jesus. Because of the reality of the resurrection, we can stand firm, nothing moving us. Resurrection Day is the formation, is the formation encouragement to always be fully about the Lord's work. Living for Him at work, at play with relatives, with friends, with enemies, with strangers, because of the reality of Jesus' resurrection. Because Jesus is indeed risen. Brothers and sisters, blessed Resurrection Day. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord God, for revealing to us the reality of you being crucified and also you, the reality of you resurrecting from the dead. Continue to give us more faith, give us more evidence, give us more inspiration, give us more confidence, Lord God, that we may truly trust you and live for you more. Thank you, O Lord God, for dying on the cross and being that risen Savior that we worship and live for. Thank you, dear Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. And now, may the God of peace, who brought back again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, equip you with all that you need for doing His will. May He produce in you, through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, all that is pleasing to Him. To Him be glory and honor. In Jesus' name, Amen. <laughs>